All right, hey, we made it. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for coming to my talk and that I hope you made it to Jack's talk yesterday. Him and Gunstelli are going to be joining me on stage after the end of this talk. Um, so my name is Abby Puz. I'm an artist and a writer. I'm based in New York and I'm also a founding member of Do Not Research. With this presentation, um, I'm gonna break the post-internet artists up into two eras, tagging the early, <laughs> is this better? Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm Abby. Uh, okay, so with this presentation, I'm gonna break up the post-internet into two eras, tagging the early period to 2012 and the late period to 2017. So, through this, um, we're gonna share how an explorer, how the self-conception of the post-internet artist changed from artist as producing work for the galleries to artist as cultural producer, broadly put. So um, I'm gonna sketch into the background the gradual turn in politiz politicization from a critique of consumer culture inherited from the 60s, 70s, new left into an apprehension of political fragmentation. Fatigue with the mainstream liberal discourse is going to remain a theme without, as will the influence of the cybernetic vision. Okay. Um, oh, and then the other thing I wanted to say is that um, I take up this tradition consciously um, because I had the really unique opportunity to take Joshua Citarella as my mentor. Um, but I think because of that, I want to share um, what I think is the political and aesthetic vision of the post-internet artist, where it came from and where I think it's going. So um, the first thing I wanna do is clarify what is net art and what is post-internet art. Okay, let's see. C cool. Okay, so this is net art. So any casual computer enthusiast of the preceding generation, and thus also the net artist, was in fact incredibly specialized. So when you look back at the work of the 90s into the mid-aughts, these artists were pushing the limits of and drawing into wide attention the inner workings of this emergent technology through browser-based art. So with this piece that we're looking at, she's abusing the browser redirect function. So um, I wonder why she stopped. <laughs> Hello, okay. Let's see if we can do it again. Okay, so the artist is using the browser redirect function in the code to make a frame animation. So every frame of this animation is its own website that, the web, that when it loads, it tells it to redirect to the next website and there you get the frame animation. So this is the language of HTML code into an apprehension of the modes of distribution but still outside of the new social forces quickly descending through web two. Okay, so, so post-net artwork, by contrast, is in conversation with the centralization of the web, the entrance of prominent commercial forces, the platforms, and the ubiqui ub 
ubiquity of the internet as a consequence of smartphones and easy to use home computers. So these artists have a direct engagement with the white cube gallery through a practice of rematerializing what could be found digitally. And later, they also brought that to institutional critique. Um, so a lot of people are like, you know, what's the real difference here? And certainly different artists would make camp in both the net art and the post-internet art. But what we learn from that is that it is not the artists who are driving the change in their creative practice, so much as the medium itself shifting beneath their feet. And um, that'll come up again and again. Okay, last thing. Who were the historic avant-garde? So the historic avant-garde were the group of artists emerging in the late 19th and early 20th century. They saw the revolution that created the middle class and a new kind of moral regime that was coming to replace the old. Rationality. If you have a bag, you're gonna have to protect it and keep on building it. They did not wanna take part in that, so they left and they started Bohemia. So the work that they made was art for art's sake, art that was valid in itself. So if we take Mondrian as an example, he, the artwork both is and exposes the underlying math and balance of composition that has made every successful painting before it. So um, with all of this in the picture, modest wealth in the, oh, excuse me, so a precondition of the historic avant-garde is an amount of modest wealth. These were middle-class people who were seeking to detach themselves from the new moral regime of rationality, but as Clement Greenberg would say, they really weren't able to. Um, what they have instead is, like what Greenberg calls the umbilical cord, umbilical cord of gold. No artist in the history of the avant-garde ever wanted to deal with rich people. It's a paradox and it's a contradiction. All right. It's 2012 now. <laughs> Woo. Um, so I think the best way to do this is let the artists introduce themselves. So. Um, I'm going to play a little bit of a Vice interview with AIDS 3D um, from 10 years ago. So let's see if it'll let me. Maybe not. So yeah, we made a list of like demands. There were supposed like, to be like demands in this like hysterical voice, but then like also things that you were like, but that's actually kind of reasonable. Very moderate, like, just, reasonable like, demands. Slightly cheaper SMS messaging. On one hand, we see all these like new technologies and the promise of transcendence, but then there's such a big chance that all of civiliz civilization is going to be kind of destroyed, or at least like. Or it feels like there's a chance towards it. And end, probably nothing happens, cool or bad. met in school in Chicago. It was a really weird story, actually. Like, our professor there, he pulled me aside, and he just kind of randomly described, like, his working process and my working process. But we had never worked together, but as kind of being the opposite. And it was sort of him being kind of brash, I guess, and me being overly cautious. Yeah, it forces you to be able to communicate your ideas, and you can't kind of hide beyond, behind the like, oh, I like it, it's me. And it's so, it, yeah, again, like, it allows us to kind of move beyond our individual egos and, uh, yeah, decide what is best for the piece. It was really kind of eerie how it was predicted by this, by this professor of ours. That's true. Like, when people, when I meet people and they say, oh, I really like AIDS 3D, sometimes it's as if it's a separate thing, and I actually don't feel like they're talking to me at all, like, and I can comfortably be like, oh, that's cool, I'm glad you like AIDS 3D, like that thing out there, and it doesn't affect the cosmos. So this is our office where we do a lot of deep thinking. It's under construction though because we're we're expanding it. 
I'm gonna make it bigger, so. Actually, I would say most of the time when I hear other people talking about our work, they seem to get it because we really put a lot of work in making things like packaged and understandable. And so like with the OMG Obelisk at the New Museum, we have this really simple message in this really simple form and then just like they combine together and you can't really miss it. It was also a good example of an early strategy for us, which was to make things that looked good in photos and looked good, like translated to the internet at a much smaller resolution, and then something that basically didn't exist in real life, because I mean, it was made out of styrofoam and knock it over like that. And actually, yeah, yeah the new museum rebuilt it, and, and it was cool. They rebuilt it exactly as we asked, kind of, but we didn't really know what to ask for, because we didn't want to ask for something that was as terrible physically as it was before. So it was kind of a weird, like, purgatory for the thing, actually. And all right, so I'm gonna stop it there. But um, so they, they brought up a couple of things that'll stay important throughout, which is um, they're making objects that are designed to land well online or be in conversation with how it lands on online. So they're talking about the OMG obelisk and it's made out of foam. It's basically a prop. Um, and th that's because they're really thinking about how an artwork gets distributed. And in fact, how it gets distributed is maybe even more important than the art object itself. So um, they're thinking about Seth Price, who this is his piece, Dispersion, from 2012. Um, it's both an essay and an object, and it's also kind of a development in conceptualism to really encourage the artist to think about distribution as where the artwork is taking place instead of the discrete art object. Um, so moving from there, this is an other, another early piece. This is um, Oliver Lyric. Um, it's from 2008, and he also presented this piece at DLD12. Um, and basically the piece is the entirety of Mariah Carey's Touch My Body music video, except everything except for Mar Mariah Carey has been green screened out. So um, he paid somebody to do it for him, and then he posted it on YouTube, and two days after posting it, there were 40 or so videos of people at home who've taken the green screen. Um, so here's one example. And um, this seems pretty intuitive to us, but again, thinking about this early period or the kind of turn from net art into post-internet art is um, you really had to be skilled. You know, it, it wasn't just anybody. It really kind of had to be the AV kid who would come in and do this. Um, so in presenting this work, um, he's flipping through. You get to the ginger kid in high school. He's putting himself next to Mariah Carey. It's very crazy. And people in the audience are clapping. And he just thinks something that I think is really important, which he just says, like, you clap when somebody else does something. And so this is really important for art because these artists stop thinking of themselves as producing one artwork, but rather editorializing that the nature of the web was not about surfing, it was instead about creating a set of conditions that other people can carry through. So that's the artist as a meme maker. It also is something a little weird where it's um, anybody can cook. It's that same sort of mentality. Anybody can cook. Anybody can come up with a really good idea for a meme format or um, even make images easier than they've ever made before. So um, Oliver Lyric is really looking at that in this piece and it's kind of, uh, an early sense of like um, how, how does art fit into the internet. It's making other things for um, people to realize and also um, that virality is going to be the new way that um, a work of art is affirmed. Um, 
if you can do something that's really popular online, it doesn't matter if the art institutions care or not because you have the numbers right here. 40 people took this video and ran with it. So again, to this idea of a play between an image and um, its representation online, um, I have two different works from Katya Novitskova. She's an Estonian artist. Um, this first one is macro expansion, and these are uh, digital prints on aluminum of cute animals. Um, and so she had this crazy idea that um, one day in the future, the attraction that we feel to technology would be similar to the pull and attraction that we feel for a very attractive, cute animal. And so she blew those up in the gallery, in the physical space, these things we understand as stock images. Um, the other thing I'll really quickly throw out here is that a lot of the post-internet artists, I actually don't know for her, but a lot of them worked as retouchers. So they were already becoming very skilled in this tool of like touching up stock photography, retouching marketing stuff, and they wanted to use it. So um, she's, she's putting something that's very clear as a photograph back into the real space of the gallery. And that's gonna be different from this piece, which is done with discs, where it's making the same claim to being in the gallery, except that these are collages and also that the artists are showing their hand a little bit by re-emblazoning that stock image, dis images logo across it. Um, another way that they show their hand is that the kind of sculptural arrow that's supposed to be in the gallery is going behind the column in a way that you start to say, I don't really believe that, you know, but it's also exposing something really cool about the, what the internet is able to bring to collaging. Um, the name of this series is Future Growth Approximations. And again, it's going back to this idea of just kind of like thinking about tech, where technology is going. It's also thinking about like the economy uh, line go up. <laughs> um, okay, so speaking of DIS, um, we are at 2016 now. It is the uh, ninth Berlin Biennale curated by DIS, and it would represent the high watermark in the ability of the art world to capture the internet's new ubiquity. I should have picked a different word, one I can say. Um, <laughs> um, so this would feature standout names such as John Raffman, Simon Denny, Cecil B. Evans, with the artist collective DIS as its chosen curators. Um, so I'm just gonna read from their press release. I think that's really important to do. Um, this is a work from Aden, uh, Anna Udenberg that's um, on screen right now as it was installed in the Biennale. Okay, so as they wrote in their press release, the ninth Berlin Biennale for Contemporary Art materializes the paradoxes that make up the world in 2016. The virtual as the real, nations as brands, people as data, culture as capital, wellness as politics, happiness as GDP, and so on. The age of the customizable sneaker, political narrow casting, algorithmic taste, and the individuated diet regimes has splintered the universal into a multiplicity of differences. Just as the figure of the individual seems to loom larger than ever, her individuality has been busted up and shattered into fragments by countervalent, contradictory forces. The Ninth Berlin Biennale will create a stage for this actor, for, the, for these, excuse me, it will create a stage for this actor of the self to role play her own obsolescence. Okay, so that's a re press release. Um, I'm just picking out um, one piece to spotlight, which is 
um, a work by Nick Cosmos, who we met before. He was one half of AIDS 3D. Um, so that's on the left, and then on the right is a detail from that year's uh, Biennale logo. Okay, so this trio of sculptures, Power Rack, Rig, and Squat Rack, pictured here at the Ninth Berlin Biennale, are both gaudy and austere. It's implied that the viewer could rise to the occasion, give in the achievable training schedule bundled with the artwork. And so the figure of this over-encumbered mother who's trying to get her stretches in while drinking her coffee and wheeling her two children around, that kind of hovers over this artwork as a kind of cautionary tail, a cautionary image, you know, yes, of course you could do the training regime, but um, can you really, with all of the things that are on your schedule, all of the optimization that is expected of you? So in this world, the task of self-transformation is interchangeable with optimization. While that will carry as a through line, this critique of wellness as politics remains principally seated in consumerism. The press release makes reference to the emergent political narrow casting. However, it was not yet the task of the post-internet artist to um, observe the kind of political fragmentation that was transforming the digital landscape and the nature of individuation. So, it's pretty ironic that the opportunity to curate the Biennale would arrive in the early part of 2016, an awareness that shows itself within the press, le press release. While the formal qualities of the work of the early period had already been solidified for quite some time, the cultural currents that would define the late period of the post-internet art were just beginning to reveal to a mainstream audience the character of what the internet was really doing to society. From Gamergate to the alt-right, it became assumed that all that was lying beneath the surface of the iceberg had its fascistic twist. As a consequence, this would ripple back into the art market, where in which the collapse of the mid-tier galleries and DIY scenes within the US was already well underway. The bubble had popped, and the money was retreating in broad strokes. And as before, with the transition from net to post-internet, the medium was shifting underneath their feet. All the while, the platforms were becoming more and more totalizing. Their long arc was being realized to capture and lock in. This operated both at the level of an individual's attention, but also the way in which culture is managed in society. The Silicon Valley entrepreneurs have seen themselves as the enabling force in a new world where everyone is an artist. By managing the visibility and distribution of cultural objects, they were delivering on the freedom of information dreamed of since the early days of the web. In fact, they were outperforming the institution's ability to access their audience. This was achieved, but with a special twist. That is, that the cultural object that was understood as interchangeable with its image, oh, excuse me, Okay, so the special twist is that the cultural object is understood as interchangeable with its image. So um, this is how the line between what is a database and what is a museum becomes blurred. What constitutes stewardship has also become contested, obscuring the value of informed tradition and leaving the leadership of the traditional institutions bereft of new inflows for funds. It, it would also come as a burden to the post-internet artist who would have to find a way to steward their own practice in the absence of a dedicated space sheltered from the market. The transition from the artist as producing work for the galleries to artist as cultural producer, broadly put, was an unfortunate symptom of this problem. This meant branching out into building digital communities, posting, stage selfies, and producing hype shit, and above all, podcasting. 
While the work of the early period also depended on virality, it was proving a new kind of, it, excuse me. So it was, it depended on virality, but at the same time, it was proving a new kind of visual literacy as it compared to the history of art, both past and present. So that conversation was not restricted to the virtual or the white cube gallery. They straddled that space. So compared to being a lone influencer, however, they must bend to the incentives of the platform, which when it wasn't a race to the bottom kind of porn, was actively backing people into a corner to reproduce certain takes for more clicks. Um, so I should quickly say that the turn to cultural producer may not be true of every artist of this moment, but it was certainly the thing that brought me to them. It was the agility with which they spoke to the current moment that reeled me in. While the presence on the mainstream platforms performed as a kind of snorkel with which to attract a wide audience, lying beneath the surface, something novel was happening. The energy that would have lent itself to fandom culture was instead being leveraged for insulated dis discussions inside of freshly retooled, excuse me, um, what would have been fandom culture was being leveraged um, for insulated discussions inside of the forum app Discord. So both new models and do not research as digital communities developed on this pretense, following from the work of Dan Keller, who we met before, Carly Busta, Little Internet, and Joshua Citarella. Metabolizing freely and semi-anonymously outside of the competitive pressures of the platforms, new ways of conceptualizing could then bubble up to the surface back into the mainstream. So while this would be the impetus for Do Not Research as a publishing platform, that movement was not limited to fully realized artworks and essays, but also the humor and clarity of thought that be, could be cycled back into posting. So. <laughs> Um, this is a friend from Do Not Research, and we were hanging out one, one day and doing the reading group, and he made this joke that he was going to start mining Bitcoin by hand. <laughs> um, so this is a video of him mining Bitcoin by hand. Um, but this is to my point where it was like, because they had this content snorkel, that was attracting a wide audience that could then be um, funneled down into the private platform Discord. Um, everyone was able to have these high level of conversations that would produce artwork and critical writing, but it would also make them really good posters. So um, I really just wanted to highlight the humor and um, agility on the internet that these people have. Okay, so being very online is cosmopolitan in its own way. Um, the slower pace of conversation inside of Discord would occasion the stewardship of and continued critical reflection on the large body of post-internet artworks. Remember, this is what brings me to them. There's plenty of people who are, did not become content producers that I would have probably never heard of because, um, because of the nature of how the digital community was built. We had people who are coming from the culture of art discourse and the terminally online who were able to blend frictionlessly and even more so productively. So the content was both a beacon and a shield, and then these curated digital communities were coming together and doing something new. So I was an undergrad student at the time. I, I joined in 2020 because of COVID. And so this was kind of like doubly exciting to me because not only was I being exposed to artworks that really spoke to my experience, but I was also finding a world of discourse that was outside of like the libbed out takes and like 
the fully insulated academic art world would, that I would have never made it into anyway. So um, sentenced to the platforms, Josh Citarella and the team at New Models were able to square the circle of curated critical discussions and the living presence of the web because we were able to do that online in digital communities. Okay, so the 2022 social media landscape. So all of those who chose to take on the role of artist as cultural, cultural producer, content creator, were forced to weather the changing terrain of influencer culture. Wedded to the social media for visibility, they were also extremely vulnerable to deplatforming and the small secretive shifts in how content is prioritized. In addition to this, they had to keep pace with the content treadmill alike to their podcasting peers. So this would come at odds with the long form reflection needed for art. And it also eventually knocked out the technique of posting that had served them so well throughout their career. So it wasn't just burnout that they faced, it was also harder to riff in front of a wide audience because of the way that Instagram was changing its um, code of conduct and following up and enforcing on it. And it also was because the only place you could go was Instagram. That's the capture and lock in that these platforms were built to do. So what happened was this placed an overemphasis on their ability to be a public speaker, deepening the valley between the thought and the images that were being produced. Altogether, the work of upkeep was overwhelming the possibility for making art. If you're, if you're a content creator, you're not just making content, you're planning it in advance. You're also reaching out to people and managing everything. So it's a full-time job. So at the same time, it was also a critical door for this artistic movement. And in speaking to the struggle for social democratic ideals and new cultural institutions, they could speak to the ways in which art itself had become restrained and backed into various corners. So the inviability of the art market, remember 2016 would kind of come too late but it would also represent the kind of highest ability of the art world to recognize what's happening online. So come 22, 2022, um, the art market's inviolable. And then also it was something that the post-internet artists always held in this kind of cautious negotiation. So this brought new challenges. So gone were the days of the speculative object, remember, um, when we looked at uh, the AIDS 3D uh, Vice interview, they had that OMG obelisk that was made out of foam. And then also the, um, the work of Katya Novitskova. Um, these are all speculative objects that are speaking to the play between what was happening online and what, what could happen in the gallery. And those were fabricated, they were not fabricated, they were collaged well, they were collaged poorly. And so without the option of the white cube gallery, it was no longer possible to make that same play of the speculative object, which was a development in conceptualism that had squared the circle of what happens to art's autonomy in both the economy of digital images and the art market. So this is something that's going to, um, in cases it became viral, we'll see on the next slide, and it also holds its own in the space of a white cube gallery. And because they were able to straddle those conditions, they were also able to defend the autonomy of the artwork. Okay. So um, while the speculative object was in conversation with the method of its distribution, um, its uneasy status and site of value also shored up its value as art. So the aesthetic gesture to observe, imitate, and accelerate trends, like we see here, um, was a hallmark of the post-internet artist. And it was also a skill that they had de developed. 
So what would begin as fresh and cutting edge content, when forced to compete as an like artist as cultural producer, they had to choose. Are they changing and directing culture, or do they maintain their critical ambivalence that they have here? So these are um, just two pieces I grabbed from uh, UV Production House, which is Brad Tremell and Joshua Citarello. It was a project that went from the mid 2010s to the late 2010s, um, and it was an Etsy store with all of these speculative objects that if one bought it, they would just send a bunch of Amazon packages to your house. Um, but the prompts were things like, invent your own unique system of non-standardized measurement, just like our parents had to do when they were our age. So it was all sort of provocations like that. And so, and again, like one of these actually made it to a gallery. <laughs> there was like it was like an incense fence or something that they had to make one day. But um, so there's a ceiling to what content is able to offer that is not there for art. So because influencers have to double down on hot takes and provocations they know will get clicks, they also corner themselves, and it becomes the main if not the battleground. So this is in contrast to a body of artwork which we have on screen now that can be both reflexive of its circumstances and flexible in its battleground. So those two different ways of understanding provocation. So the second image, um, it kind of behaves as a command. It says, just project good person on your house at night to show everyone you're a good person. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of a command. That's how you tell everyone, you, that's how you tell the world that you're a good person. But also at the level of the collage, the art image is this like half-assed projector setup where they didn't even like key it right, it's like the N is falling over the side of the house. And so there's all of this additional information that's being presented formally that is not possible when one is podcasting because you have to adhere to a certain call to action. Um, yeah, so in our the form that it can take has an infinite horizon. And so as one of the affordances of the avant-garde project, you can create art that's valid solely on its own terms. So um, this is another artwork that's pretty close to my heart, where it's actually two of them um, by Joshua Citarello. But you, you kind of get this figure of a prepper in the future who is like desperately looking everywhere to stock up on this like glossy assortment of handicrafts and bespoke survival tech. And so it's a good portrait because this neurotic character even goes so far as to draw the things that he can't find or buy. So like on the left-hand side, he's just drawn a crossbow. <laughs> and so it's like the, the like, neurotic necessity to like prep and get all this survival gear is also in conversation with the Photoshop as a medium, you know? Hell, if I can't Google it and find one I like, I'll just draw it. And so I find that really masterful and also kind of speaks to just how broad art can be and when it's, punches above its weight because it's in conversation with the tool itself. Again, these are artists who, many of them are working as Photoshop retouchers. They have to use the damn thing all day and they're making use of it as art. So, um, I, should, I should drink something. Okay, so for the artist as cultural producer, the call to action in content creation appears to be interchangeable with that of artwork. So 
look, my audience is so much bigger because I'm a podcaster and like, what the hell? I was in the art world and people just wanted to charm, you know, they just wanted me to charm them over the dinner table. So like, you're making all this art, but like, where the hell does it even go? Like, who even cares? You know, like, the art world is dumb and stupid and stupid and stupid. And so, and they all say this, they all say this. Um, so <laughs> that's their gripe. But as I said before, being an influencer, the design of the platform locks people into certain takes, which in the long run either becomes boomered out or forces the influencer to up the ante until they're just like a cartoonish version of themselves. So fidelity to the brand becomes a speed limit to creativity and intuition. Most importantly though, is that from this point of view, it seems like the only site of departure of progress appears to be directing and changing from within the market because they're no longer have this critical ambivalence of the artist, they have to leverage and position themselves in order to maintain them, their status, their clout, what have you. Okay, so um, again, as artists producing work for galleries, their on-target imitation of the market and premonition of neoliberal antics was shockingly expressive. Now, dependent on the platforms, that skill was frighted with the responsibility to leverage and position themselves and their ideas. So this becomes a major loss in a kind of critical ambivalence that art affords. So can't do the art market, and they also have this position against institutional insularity. Remember, the museums of old are like fossils. <laughs> they can't keep up. They don't know what's happening online. Fuck them. And so, uh, because they can't speak to the change in culture brought on by the internet, they had one thing to fall back on, which was the promise of individuals to freely self-organize on the web. Concurrent with this moment would also be the explosion of political, of, excuse me, of politicized online communities in Gamergate and later the alt-right. So crucially, an arm of the post-internet artists would advance from the critique of consumer culture into an observation of political fragmentation dutifully designed, like, excuse me, which was like assigned as their domain because they were the internet people. So this looking at political fragmentation being politicized online is very, very different from like the squat rack rig of the Berlin Biennale, even though that work was made from 2016. So that again kind of points to that too little, too late, a little bit. Um, so, all the while, the ghost of the millennial left experiment in building alternative political solidarity online was hanging over everybody's heads. So it's like, it's like pretty crazy to think that like Occupy Wall Street is like a know your meme meme. Like like seriously, like what the hell? That's crazy. That went like people went out in the world because of that hashtag. Like, and not just in New York, and not just on the West Coast, but all over the world. And like, one of the ways that it's being preserved is through Know Your Meme. So again, there's this like, and um, ooh, I just wanted to say also that this is like from 2011. So this is an experiment in building political solidarity online that comes way before that of the alt-right and Gamergate. Um, and it was also proposed by a magazine. It was proposed by the Culture Jamming mag. Oh, well, excuse me. Yeah, it was a Culture Jamming magazine, Adbusters. So this is all very weird. <laughs> okay. So it was the accelerationist theorists who all the post-internet artists were super into that would articulate the cycle of hope and burnout 
escalation and de-escalation that was being produced by the pragmatic left. Because Occupy Wall Street was a failure, but it was also this like huge escalation. Anybody you talk to is just like, you just had to be there, man, you know? So, um, but it failed and it, it, you know, and it's a, a huge uh, obstacle in trying to think about how we can have a, fu a left future. So, um, yeah, so both the artists and the accelerationist theorists that they were really into and read all of their books, um, they were looking for an alternative to social democratic politics um, because they saw it fall on its face over and over and over again. So Mark Fisher in his text, Capitalist Realism, reminds us in, he reminds us about the way that this disappointment, this feeling of failure becomes memory hold and is at, in fact an adaptive strategy for those in power. So it's like in the United States, it's like, I don't know, <laughs> in the United States, um, just pick anything, just pick anything, anything that gets people up in arms and then burns them out. Um, so, uh, he's pointing out the fact that that's actually useful for those who are in power, for everyone to feel this fatigue. And it's also the same fatigue that these artists have been making fun of the whole time. Um, you know, s sticking a computer into a water fountain to talk about <laughs> how much energy we're wasting. You know, it's, it's supposed to poke fun at that. Um, that, that kind of liberal policy-making idea of how we can make the world better. Um, so, yeah, and, and ultimately what Mark Fisher was advocating for is in the face of that kind of burnout and disappointment, um, to have a critical detachment. And so in doing that, other, future become, other futures become possible. And so there's the critical detachment that they're able to articulate, but also the accelerationist writers such as Nick Zernicek and Helen Hester would pen their own hopes for policy with the theoretical twist that all that was needed to open our depressed collective imagination was the introduction of a new radical positive project for the left to rally behind. So, the problem of the left was that it just kept falling on its back foot and resorting only to negative solidarity. And what they put in their place, is, in that place, is a kind of reinvigorated confidence in technology and then also a rediscovery of Marx as pro tech. Um, so, the accelerationist, in their attempt to find an alternative to democratic socialism, had found a bridge between their understanding of the present day obstacles to the left and a systems thinking approach. So this appealed to the artist, remember, because um, they took to be their center a concept's distribution over its discrete presence as an art object. How it travels online, um, is more important than the object in the gallery, even though it affords them uh, the kind of cr critical discussion that they want to have. So um, this appeals to the artist, and it would also be an expressive gesture in art and consistent with the widely adopted vision of cybernetics launched with computer technology. Um, but it would also come to undermine the critical detachment of the artist themselves. So while incredibly critical of um, all of the ideology that's baked into the internet, including the California ideology, the long arc of the platforms to capture and turn inward, and the failed attempts at building political solidarity online, such as with Occupy Wall Street, um, still, there was something of the cybernetic vision that held some optimism. Cybernetics 
would fruitfully decenter the discrete individual through its study of circular causality, feedback mechanisms within biological and social systems. So underscoring this belief was the concept that the self-regulating system would always bring itself back to balance or homeostasis. And so in its recent, mis like, okay. <laughs> and so its recent turn is one of like apolitical and mysticism and this sense that really God was in there. And that's how you get to like ideas that are floating around the web right now, like network spirituality. Um, and even though that would be a vision of eternal kinship and collectivity, like God is everywhere, it's in the computer, it's, um, it's in the way that people come together through the computer. Um, that story is also to the exclusion of the actions of the individual. Remember, we're, we're doing this zoomed out, top down view of the relationships between different social bodies. So that's not really a story of the individual, that's the story of like big groups of people. So, you know, you get God, but you also lose individual, you know, the individual's agency towards their own self-transformation. And, you know, that's just like nuts because then there's no point of departure for individual freedom because there was never any story to begin with. It was, if it's the story is like everyone was just floating around <laughs> and um, in the computer, how are we supposed to self-transform and realize ourselves? So I'm trying to connect that problem back to the historic avant-garde. Um, and we need to understand what makes this contemporary moment different because on its face, both movements are pretty similar. You know, they're both casting away the old systems of patronage. But in today's moment, they were actually abandoned by the patronage and that's been masked over by this big middle finger to the old way of doing things. And that appears to be consistent with the historic avant-garde. Still, the soft spot they had to land on was that they believed in some way in the promise of the internet as a democratic forum, be it for validating the art of the time or building political solidarity, it was still an open question. So again, the cybernetic vision decentered the individual to the exclusion of the story of individual freedom. I know it's a lot, but <laughs> um, things were worse off than where they started. Um, while the historic avant-garde begins with the story of the bourgeois revolution, their rebellion was superficial and they remained attached by that umbilical cord of gold. You know, they still kept their wealth. They didn't actually run away to Bohemia. They depended on like parent money, <laughs> literally. And so, um, so this is something a little different that's happening today, and it's something that can't see itself in the mirror. You know, the bourgeois revolution, that which aimed to destroy the feudal system and establish the rights of the individual, the language with which we talk about our own wish for emancipation and rights comes from them. And so I, I think that like, the, I think that the story of the post-internet artist kind of reveals the state of social disintegration that's shared by us all. Um, I think that, that they are, uh, I think that they are the avant-garde and I also think that they're undermining themselves and I want that to stop. So that's the end of my talk.
I can play it on loop. Let me just. I'm just gonna do it like that. Yeah, you, you just sit down. Oh, I see. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Cool. Okay. Hey, so um, I'm being joined by Jack and Gunselli. Do you really want me? Okay, it sounds good. It seems like the the, the assortment of mics are. <laughs> Are there? Hello, testing. Okay. Hello, I feel like I'm on a talk show right now. Um, I'm Gunsteli. I'm a writer at Dazed and Confused. I write about youth culture and the internet. Um, thank you so much, Abby, for that insightful talk. I'm just going to put this pint of water down. You don't, you don't got it? Yep. Everyone can always share it. This one's live. Okay, cool. So yeah, I feel like um, there's a lot to touch on from everything you've said so far, but before we do, um, I guess it goes without saying, both of you are really heavily involved in Do Not Research. Um, and yeah, I think it would be perhaps helpful to begin with both of you talking about your roles on the platform, how you both got started. Yeah, sure. So, so yeah, we, we, um, yeah, we met in the... Um, do not research Discord, but really before that, we became friends through Josh Littorello's Chart of Truth uh, conspiracy Twitch stream, and in the uh, Twitch chat, we started making jokes and kind of became friends there. And the Discord came afterwards, and this really intense uh, experience of this massive online community, kind of 24/7 discourse and and uh, memes being made. Um, so he, so. So coming to Unsound, we want to kind of give that experience for the Unsound community. So we, um, for the past month, we've engaged in this uh, uh, artist residency inside the Unsound Discord. And right now we're watching a video that was produced during this past month of artist residency. This is the um, image chain game. So users would, would post an image that referenced the last one, and we're just watching it on loop here as we talk. Okay, great. And wait, how'd you mention it was like a thing from Tumblr when we'd spoken last? Or? Yeah, yeah. This is this is a holdover from Tumblr. Um, and it was like a way to kind of generate an internet aesthetics because like, you know, one image to the next, it might relate in terms of like its formal qualities, like the color and the shape, but it also might relate in terms of the content. And um, it was a really early way of like, kind of intuiting that and through like users, but it also comes from, sorry, what is her name again? The artist? Uh, yeah, well, it comes from a Discord called Lightshine Chamber, which is where I first saw it. Um, but I thought it was really interesting because it kind of mixes this uh, Tumblr like mood board aesthetic with like a game. So you're, you're, it's, like, it's like forcing you to kind of like think aesthetically about the images and kind of commute, um, um, communicate in this image only way. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was really fun uh, doing this in the Unsound Discord for the past month. And um, yeah, it like really led to some like interesting uh, combinations here. Great. And um, so Abby, you are co-director of Do Not Research. And I know Jack as well, you're heavily involved in new models. Um, how would you describe your kind of roles in these platforms? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's changed. Um, and also both of these communities have really outlived anything else that's tried to be like it. So um, there's kind of the COVID era and then there's today. And um, the COVID era was really just like, um, I don't know. I mean, like, I, I basically we we were kind of taking Joshua Citarella as like a kind of teacher figure, and he actually released several syllabuses that myself and my best friend Margot would be the kind of TA for, and we would teach the tax to a group of like honestly like twenty to thirty people. We had to make it private because it was too many people. <laughs> um, yeah, so kind of like a TA figure, but now it's um, now it's about friendship. 
<laughs> Great. Um, yeah, and the, yeah. The, I mean, the reading group was really uh, was really a powerful um, experience. I mean, there was a lot of these kinds of like Zoom rooms that popped up during COVID to like try to get some sort of like social interaction when we were all in lockdown. But I really appreciated the reading group because it was really quite different from an academic setting, and that we were like really trying to understand the the uh, the uh, the uh, text we were reading, like really understand them and and try to apply them, you know, to the situation that that, that we were in, rather than just kind of like showing up for a class and saying something so you get like checked off on the list or something like that. Um, yeah, my my role in new models is um, I see myself as kind of like a a uh, yeah like a like a I don't know what you call it, like a, um, a community producer. I try to get people together to kind of engage in these large uh, swarm crafted projects um, and like working with kind of like the uh, incredibly talented and brilliant people in the discord there as well as the host to kind of bring these projects together um, as well as kind of a communicator and condensing and compressing things that are happening on the discord into uh, yeah, pieces of information that can kind of travel um, beyond the walls of the discord. Uh, uh, an example of this is a project I engaged in, um, which uh, maybe we can talk about. In a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, we'll go back to that project in a bit. But um, so, just for the un uninitiated, um, what kind of you've done a great job just earlier speaking about all the work that Brad and Josh have been putting in in like the last few years. But I guess what I'm interested in is. What kind of artwork do we see in the present, especially on Do Not Research and kind of beyond that? Yeah, I mean, um, my, you know, my hope is that we will be part of the tradition of the post-internet artists, or at the least, the work that we've done in the last two years. Um, and a lot of it is kind of trying to build up a portrait of um, life online. So you have work like Nick Vyzotsky's La La La, which is like this living, breathing index of images online and you're, and it's super rapid. And the way you're supposed to watch it is like three inches from your eye, kind of, I'm kidding, but it's also maybe true, but you know, through rapidly cycling, cycling through like years and years and years of internet images, um, it becomes to feel as a person that that the internet is like somebody you've known for a long time. And so you get things like that, and then you also get things like um, Flip Caustic's PC bed, which is trying to speak to kind of the condition of working on the computer. And um, he built the computer into his bed so the screens were going over his eyes, and there was like three of them, and um, the computer was built underneath, so it was lit up. So it was a sculpture and a performance project, and it was kind of, kind of, trying to straddle the space of being like a wage slave and no privacy because your jobs in your room, but also um, being somebody who just like actually really likes computers, <laughs> you know. Cool. Um, so another thing I think you did a really good job of highlighting is that kind of pipeline from artist who makes objects to content creator. Um, and I guess my question would be like, where, like, where do we go from here once you kind of become so kind of fixed and dependent on what your audience is saying and like your previous streams so, so that you're not chasing your tail? What's like the way out of that? Yeah, I, I mean, it's... Um my hope is that it kind of just raises an eyebrow. I mean, it's the, the, the truth is they're they're kind of you you kind of have to like I don't know it's it's a weird thing. Mostly the device of <laughs> you can stop that. It's the it's the medicine alarm. Uh, <laughs> um, it's it's like a worthy experiment. I would say, but I, I also think that um, you, hmm. it, it's. <laughs> maybe I can throw something out as the kind of a, um, something I've been really focusing on the past couple of years as this uh, post-internet 
um, post internet artists have kind of like moved into this like content production like online community world is is this idea of devirtualization where mm -hmm. taking um, experiences and uh, uh, the way that we like live online and finding different ways that it can find its way back into like the real world or real physical objects that could like live in um, a gallery or circulate, you know, um, in different ways and kind of like higher fidelity ways. Um, so some recent examples were the, um, the uh, Do Not Research group show in uh, Holyoke, Massachusetts. Um, and the uh, New Models Codex book, which is like a book we came together to make in um, uh, after the uh, the uh, the uh, 2020 um, uh, pandemic year, um, so these kinds of like, you know, taking the kind of content and uh, this the, the, this kind of like fleeting ephemeral quality of podcasts and live streams, or there, you know, you just need to be making more and more and try to de-virtualize that and slow it down into something that can kind of like la has a has kind of like a more like lasting. Yeah, I, I think it's just maybe my point is like, you know is is all of the moments of slippage where you've t talked yourself out of being an artist, but it's also um, kind of has the same high goals of art and just, but it also they've only been doing this for like a couple years. And then also it's for me in this presentation, just a, a, maybe more of a vehicle to talk about like the broader, like both trends, like network spirituality, and also um, the, uh, um, how, how far things have fallen and how much harder it is. Because there's, there, there's people that I have in my head that are like this, but then there's also people who were just like in this as like gallery artists that like, you know, are also now podcasters or now make toys. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think there's also something happening where um, maybe in a, uh, previous moments, you would kind of like grow up and learn about art with the hopes of one day becoming an artist and creating something that could kind of like change people's ideas or like even go so far as like change the world through the art. This is kind of this like, this like, character of the artist and you know it's like that's wrapped up in all kinds of cultural moments and politics and, th and things like that but now we really have entered into a moment where you know you like learn about like techniques and uh, and like like processes of making art but then that's just applied to creating content or creating youtube videos or live streams and i think that is like kind of like a real shift in the uh, potential of art um so yeah that was, that was just something yeah it's tricky it's also I, like i said it's like it's the way that I found this art, and it's my favorite kind of art. So, like, they're definitely stuck because <laughs> I want other people to find it. I mean, the real answer is not for them, it's that somebody should step up and be the institution yeah. and steward the work. So, then just to return to so, you've written about devirtualization quite, quite extensively. Um, just for the audience, I guess, do you mind just going into a bit more detail? Like, yeah. Yeah, so devirtualization is a term that was um, first. Like I came to it in a in a in a different different way, but I I found that on Urban Dictionary, this kind of like online uh, uh, reference for like all kinds of like weird and and sometimes offensive slang. Devirtualization is logged on there around 2010 as a definition for when you meet someone that you have become friends with online first and you meet them in real life. Mm -hmm. That is like devirtualization. You know, I don't know if this is a term that's like actually used or if this was like one person that came up with it in 2010. Um, in any event, the way that I came to it um, was through uh, kind of this like meditation on debt and kind of the way that that is shifting the um, the uh, vectors for the built environment. And so I started thinking about houses and these kind of uh, post gentrification landscape as a devirtualization of the speculative objects of like the stock market and this like zero interest um, um, rate. And like kind of after that genesis, I started. Um, uh, I started seeing it as a way to push past the um, uh, post-structuralist trap of like everything is a spectacle and we're all kind of like mediated through the spectacle and there's there's no one um, you know there's no one beyond that we're all it's, every, everything is just captured by the spectacle. Well, it's like well why you know while that may be true, 
it may even be possible to push past that and to like find a human on the other side of it. And so, you know, instead of being trapped in this virtuality, maybe we can de-virtualize it in, in different ways. And, you know, this could have, you know, really like positive aspects as well as really kind of like dangerous and like negative aspects at the same time. But I think it is kind of like a shift that may be happening um, that is something that to, to, to explore as well as being a kind of, um, a, a strategy for making art um, about the internet that, that, that you want to take physical form. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I guess also in the last few years, um, something which we've really seen, like seen come into prominence a lot is, as you've both touched on, like the power of online communities and like these kind of bubbles of discourse. Um, and I feel like a big part of that is also what you were speaking about with the power of anonymity, can't say that word, being anonymous. <laughs> Anonymity. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, I guess it would be really interesting to hear both of your opinions on that and how being anonymous has, or like the power to be at least, has kind of um, changed like art culture. Right. I mean, I think in this, in the most immediate context, it's just like um, that you don't have to be, you know, it doesn't have to be Abby as the brand Abby that's talking to you. And that, that was really like the kind of power of Discord was to kind of resurface the kind of handle. Like I used hacky sack for whatever reason <laughs> for like the first four or five months of knowing everyone. And so, you know, to, but also that you would toggle between that. So like one of the things that like Do Not Research did really early was it was like, we're gonna be face-to-face -face friends. And so like we got on Zoom and then we were getting on Zoom twice a month at least. And like, you know, kind of being able to toggle between like the forum poster and then like as much as you can be online, like the face-to-face -face friend, um, I think is more useful than like the being siloed or stuck in one. Yeah, so I think that anonymity Anonymity online has really taken a very, um, the way it gets talked about is, is like almost always in like a negative way, how having the ability to be anonymous online um, invites terrible uh, trolling and all kinds of like aggrievement. Um, I, I think that there is kind of like a positive aspect to it too, where we were saying like, um, you know, these like discords are kind of like an anonymous first community. So you, mm -hmm. you, you just know someone as their handle first and then the way that they, what they talk about and what they reveal slowly, you get to like know them more and more and more. And then eventually, you know, you maybe even get to have like a face-to-face -face interaction through Zoom or in real life. And this, yeah, again, this like process of like right. de-virtualizing, like pulling out of it. Um, it's also like a closed community. So it's like not a sea of Reddit comments. It's like, okay, this guy, like this is the kind of content he likes. So he always comments on this, you know? And so you, that's the way you start to get a feeling because there's actually not too many people in the room when it comes to Discord. I mean, obviously there's like thousand person ones, but not the way that these digital communities are built. Yeah, and how, how have you kind of felt that evolve on like a personal level? Would you say? I mean, these are like these are the friends I have now. <laughs> like, I mean, like my college education was just like blasted to pieces, and like I was just on the computer all the time. So like, the, you know, these are true friends. And then in an another way, it's kind of like I've lived through something with them because I was able to experience COVID with them. And so like they're they're like true friends now, and that's also not anything that can be replicated ever again, I don't, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, fingers crossed. Um, and I'm conscious we probably have about five minutes, I'm guessing, someone shout. Well, I'm just gonna keep going till they shut us down. Um, <laughs> okay. So you, at the end of your talk, was it? I've got time. Oh, I've got time, okay, cool. Um, well, yeah, at the end of your talk, you kind of touched on network spirituality um, a bit, and I think something that I found interesting personally is that kind of, like the political fracturing and like the individualization of kind of culture, but to the point in which um, like it does lead to this amorality, um, which almost feels just like this kind of big blind faith in big tech, which is kind of doubled as a god. Yeah. Um, 
No, yeah. you put that really well. It's like, it's like, again, I'm kind of trying to use this as like a vehicle to talk about tr the trends that are happening. So like a lot of the network spirituality people were like dirtbag left for like fans. Like they were people who were like realized how the way in which this like, you know, the kind of pragmatic left, the left that can actually do something like burns you out and then makes you cynical and then keeps ruling anyway. And so there, there were people who were trying to find an alternative to that and you get the dirtbag left comedian podcaster who also kind of failed to deliver on their promises even though they were like a much more like aesthetically attractive thing they always they also had their own thoughts about policy that couldn't happen and so people became disillusioned with that and um many people kind of just backswinged into this weird apolitical like okay, I know the computer is doing something to me, like the computer is animating something about my life and my friends' lives. You know, that sounds like God to me, but that's also like the market. Like that's the market changing you and the market changing your friends. And so like, I'm really trying like, and spending a t like a lot of time trying to figure out like, you know, how to get unstuck from there, from this story that like just has no room for like the, the actually existing story of like emancipation and freedom, which is actually in fact a pretty linear one. And most people don't want to hear that. Yeah, no, because I feel like the way it's presented is very much like this new phenomena. Um, but I guess when you kind of like look at the history of things, like one thing that popped into my head was like the metal scene and like when like black metal came about and like people were burning churches and then there's the other side of it who's like, okay, you're burning churches, but what about anti-fascism, you know? Um, so it does like come around every so often, but I guess the worrying concern with this is when it is conflated with like the power of the internet, which like bolsters yeah, All yeah. Of the black pilledness, you know. Yeah, there's like a weird kind of belief in technology that, like, I try and walk back to like the cybernetics of the 30s, mm. which is also the same technology that created like the military-industrial complex. But it was like, it also was like a revolutionary way of like apprehending of how things worked, like, you know. The, the foxes would kill the rabbits and then they like they would get to you know and then the rabbit population would come back and there would be less foxes you know like those are things that are like true and of the world and they are also incredibly like expressive all of the changes in the market incredibly expressive that's why all of the uv production house jokes are so funny like there's the one that's just like live on your, you know, <laughs> live on your outdoor porch and rent out your room for Airbnb, <laughs> you know? It's like that kind of prophetic gesture in art is awesome and I would never knock it, but, and it's also like totally cool to like observe the kind of ways that it animates us and the kind of mystical quality. The problem is when that's like, to the exclusion of the story, which is pretty, you know, there is one at least of just like, you know, how we recognize our own right to freedom. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, but then at the same time, so I feel like all of this is going on. Then kind of in the background, we have this kind of progressive move out of capitalism. It's like clearly kind of busting at the seams at this point and this move towards this techno-feudal structure. Um, I guess, how, is there a way out of the techno-feudal? It's a big question to ask with five minutes, but. Yeah, um, I mean, my, yeah, yeah. go ahead, guess, sorry, Jack. <laughs> I guess like, um, 
I guess what I would say about that, well, like first, like to define like uh, techno feudalism is basically the idea mm -hmm. that uh, these like technology companies that have like created these like entire economies, like you can look at the rise, the you know massive rise of um, of of, of a video production and and f and and like freelance photography, video stuff in the past ten years is a you know that was generated by the platforms that like needed more advertising, so this like whole like industry like like spun up around it. So like these like. These technology companies that are, um, uh, 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 Zuboff calls it um, uh, a new species of power, um, instrumentarian power, where you are um, controlling the vectors of how people are going to like learn about society in the future. These uh, tech companies are kind of like more powerful than any like nation state and operate completely um, autonomously as like you know like little like monarchies. So that's like the tech um, uh, tech feudalism. Um, what I would say about that is that like. You know, I think that there's a projection of power coming out of, of these companies but that, that then is reinforced through kind of academic writing, kind of theorizing this kind of like totalizing power. But the closer you get to it, it's it's kind of like a shit show. Like like once you get inside of these companies, you realize that like it's not really you know they're not these like masters of the universe, and these things are actually quite fragile and um, you know falling apart in all different ways. Which is not great. I mean, this is wreaking havoc across the world and things. But I think that there is a way to kind of steer out of it and use the kind of massive um, you know inf uh, 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 digital infrastructure that is being built. You know, I think there is a way to kind of like build another level on top of that so that people can organize in different ways and you know using discord to create you know these like new institutions these new like forms of like um you know outside the academic walls like ivory tower like creating like all of these new like you know uh you know new studies and things discord is a company that makes something so people can go and play counter-strike together it's like organizing video game, you know, World of Warcraft raids. That's what it's designed for, but that doesn't mean it can, it has to be used that way. You, know, you can use that to like, you know, do other things. So that's what I would say about it in kind of like practical terms. Okay, cool. And so then just to, just to clarify, I don't know if anyone else would find this um, helpful, but so you've mentioned techno-feudalism. Where does platform capitalism come into this? I, I could... Yeah, so platform capitalism, really quickly, platform <laughs> capitalism is basically the idea that one in, the, <laughs> in the, you know, in the past like 10 to 15 years, you all this, companies, <laughs> all kind of like big companies that used to like produce kind of straightforward products that would be consumed by people or other businesses, these companies are forced to change their entire business model and turn into platforms. So instead of selling mm, products, okay. you're selling access to plat uh, access to uh, like a good in the in, in the future, and this is because of the declining rate of profit, so you have to kind of like find new ways to eke out more profit from what you're being produced, um, from what you're producing. And, you know, this is like a real challenge for companies and like businesses and, and you know, even, um, you know, something like this, this kind of like experimental festival, you know, everyone is affected by this and starts to have to like rethink themselves as like accessing a platform in some way. And, you know, even as individuals, we're kind of, you know, you know, we feel this, uh, you know, we're talking about like the take treadmill, you become a platform for takes and you just have to like wind yourself up and like keep going and stuff. And so I think like trying to disengage from that and, you know, slow down and, you know, think about like other ways to do that, I, th I think is would, would be the move on a micro level. <laughs> yeah, I think you smashed that. Um, thank you. <yeah. <laughs> and yeah, thank you so much for those great talks. Thanks thank you, Griselle.